is Mike Scott from the Flock of Seagulls with DJ D Phoenix, and this is the Groove Zone. Yes. and roll just like that yes oh my gosh business is out of the way yeah, awesome yeah. how are you doing i'm not too bad actually yeah i was uh while i was waiting to get on to you i was just watching a program called soul america so it's a one-off tv thing okay i was just watching all this stuff that i know i mean it influenced me when i was a kid it's all about temptations and james brown and isaac hayes and curtis mayfield and all these people that I mean, I grew up on black music. I, I grew up on soul and Motown. It's right, 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 right. So I, I just, I just had to leave it when they were playing "Heard It Through the Grapevine," and I thought, "Oh, what well, is this?" Oh I man, I'm, right. well, I'm recording it. I'm recording it, so it's fine. Gotcha. Actually, that's one of my favorite genres as well. Late '60s, early '70s soul, and yeah. I totally love that. Oh well, I mean, listen, I'm, I've. I'd say I'll, I'll probably say I'll finish it this week. I'm just finishing my autobiography. I'm finishing it this weekend. I've got oh, two wow. of them. Yeah. Wow. And one, one of the things I realised when I was writing this book is, um, I mean, bear in mind, I didn't come from a musical background. Okay. No one in my family played music. Um, how, I, how I got into it is a long story, but anyway, I've got into music. And um, one of the things that's always struck me is, how on earth did I know, not just how to sing, but I could pitch and do harmonies. And I thought, how on earth do you know that? And it's only when I was doing the book, and I, I remember, I, and I mean, the book started life as, um, I was basically tra uh, transcribing my diaries that I kept in the 80s. I kept right. the diary. Right. And there's all stuff in there about, you know, meeting, Boy George and meeting different people that we're bumping into and meeting this okay. Michael. Okay. So it's all there. And as I was doing that, I thought I really should expand them because it just became a snapshot of those years. And I thought it's not really a book, it's just like a snapshot of those years. But right. someone said to me, You really ought to make it more rounded and make it about you and how you started. So I went right back to the beginning. And as I wrote about the beginning, and I and I and I sort of cast my mind back and see, I remember listening to Standing in the Shadows of Love. Um, I, thought, I remember that. I remember where I was and in the room listening to them. This this tune is amazing, and and then listening also to other stuff that I don't know if you know, but things like um, uh, the, the the tremolos and all these other them, yeah, these sixties bands, and uh, and listening to well, obviously the Beatles, and then the Monkeys, okay, and, and realizing that. And the Beach Boys as well, in particular, and, re and then realizing as I was writing the book, realizing, hang on a second, these bands were famous for their harmonies, and obviously all the four tops and the Temptations were, in a, but these right. bands, their harmonies what made them. Their harmonies what made my hair stand on it, but I didn't realize until now. That's where I got it from. That's that influenced me and basically taught me how to sing. And wow. I, I, I didn't even know I could do harmonies until. Um, I got on, on the tour bus one day with, with my romance in the very early days and uh, someone brought out a guitar and started strumming and was singing and they started singing Sloop John B. Beach okay. Boys. Yeah, okay. Um, so as they're doing it and I, you know, I was new to the band and they're doing this and I thought, yeah, you know, um, I, was, I was actually the last person to join before we then had our hits. Okay. And, and they're singing this song and I just this harmony was coming out somewhere and everyone was like singing and they went and they all stopped and turned around and I, I was like why are you looking at me and they went you can sing and I, <laughs> can I they went, yeah right that's it you're straight out to the shops and we're going to buy you a headphone a head a headset mic you know Madonna style but this right. was in 1981 so it's before Madonna they said we're going to buy you a headset mic and I thought what is that it's a mic you wear on your head, okay? And you're going to sing while you're playing the drums because if you can sing like that, we're going to harness that and use it within the band. Wow! But I had no idea, and I always used to wonder how did I know how to do that? 
to, to pitch and get there. Right, right. But it's from the Beach Boys and um, uh, all the Motown stuff, all of the Motown. Okay, um, okay. Fun enough, the first band I ever saw live ever as an eight year old were the Beach Boys. The Beach Boys, really? First band, I saw, and I wasn't into music even then. Someone said, Oh, we're going to see this concert by the Beach Boys. And I went, They said, Do you want to come? You know, these older people, they're going to take me as a little kid. You know? Right, right. I went, yeah, yeah, well, why not? And I went, I like the music, but I remember thinking, why is everyone screaming? They're really not that bad. They're screaming, <laughs> they're screaming, they're screaming and crying. And I thought, why are you crying? They're not that bad. You know, they're really pretty uh. bad. Yeah, like, obviously at the time, I'd never seen anything like that. Um, Beatlemania was relatively new. I hadn't really seen it. I was going to say, yeah, because screaming and crying would definitely describe Beatlemania for sure. Yeah, but right. they, was, they were doing this in the Beach Boys concert. And of course, because I haven't seen it, I'm thinking, why is everyone crying? What's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> but that bad, I mean, I remember getting the, uh, someone I knew had their album and I sort of borrowed it for a while. And I remember thinking, this is great. But I didn't know what it was I loved about it. I loved the music, the whole thing, generally. But I didn't know that I'd be picking things out of it and storing them. Right, right. Later, later. and I, I had no aspirations, no desire to be a musician of any kind of singer a drama nothing it's never so obviously all that stuff got soaked in spun spun style it just stayed there and then later on it just when i did become a musician it just sort of came out and and i had all these all these files locked up and was able to access them without even knowing right right then i have to ask how in the world did you end up with a position as a drummer with modern romance, if if it wasn't something that you were necessarily or necessarily setting out to do, right? Well, I mean, obviously, by the time I joined Modern Romance, I did want to be a musician. Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. What I'm saying, as a kid, I had no no visions and no idea, right. no no desires to be a drummer or any kind of musician. Okay. Um, and what happened was complete sort of freak accident thing. What freak? Uh, you know. I've I, I realised that life is a set of circumstances that happen. And a circumstance could be you stepped out on the street and a driver was looking at his phone and ran you over. You know, that's a, that's a, that's, a that's, yeah, that's something you've got no control of. That's a, you know, something that was, it was just written. That's meant to be, you're meant to get hit by that car. Sometimes right. you're meant to be in the right place at the right time. That's the wrong place, obviously. Sometimes right. you're in the right place by sheer chance, you're not getting hit by the truck. You've gone somewhere else, walked into a room, and something's happened. Gotcha. What I'm saying, as a kid, I had no no visions and no idea, right. no, no desires to be a drummer or any kind of musician. Okay. Um, and what happened was complete sort of freak accident thing. Freak, uh, you know... I, I've realised that life is a set of circumstances that happen. And a circumstance could be you stepped out on the street and a driver was looking at his phone and ran you over. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a <laughs> that's, yeah, that's something you've got no control of. That's, that's a, you know, something that was, it was just written. That's meant to be, you're meant to get hit by that car. Sometimes right. you're meant to be in the right place at the right time. That's the wrong place, obviously. Sometimes right. you're in the right place by sheer chance, you're not getting hit by the truck. You've gone somewhere else, walked into a room, and something's happened very positive. And one of them was um, I had a guy that I was friends with at school. And I used to go to his house every evening after school to go there, listening to music. Um, at the time, I was, I was into all kinds. I, mean, I still am now, but I was into all kinds of music. And I was, at the time, getting into Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple and okay. pro progressive rock. Still, my Motown roots still very much there. I just discovered David Bowie. Okay. And Bowie fan. I became, I became absolutely not obsessed, but enthralled with what he could do with music. I was like, who is this guy? What's going on? So I having discovered him when he did um, John Armoni Dancing and Starman. Okay. I, then went, I then went back and started buying his old albums, like Hunky Dory and Man Who Sold the World. Right. And, discovered it and I thought where's this guy been hiding what's going on what's, this is great you know 
Um, but so I was, I was into music and I was loving listening to it and I couldn't get enough of music. And there was, there was no genre that I would say, I can't listen to that. I was into my Motown, I was into my rock, I was into my little bit of jazz, a bit of this, a bit of that, you know. Um, and I went to this guy's, I, I was going to this guy's house every evening, listening to different stuff. I'd go, yeah, it's great. You know, Genesis, I remember discovering Selling England by the Pound and thinking what an amazing band these are. Okay. Santana, Santana, I discovered at the time as well. And then I went to this guy's house one evening. He said, oh, when you come around my house tonight? He said, um, he was in, I don't know if you know what the Boys Brigade is. I said, did you have that in America, the Boys Brigade? It's like a bit like the Scouts, but a variation of the Scouts. Right, 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 right. And they have the Boys Brigade have um, a little marching thing where they have a band and march in the streets and stuff. And he joined the Boys Brigade and he was playing, you know, so when they do the marching, they have the little snares, the little snare drums. Okay. And he learned to play a snare drum. And so he said, my mum and dad, because I was in the Boys Brigade, had bought me a drum kit. And I went, oh, okay. I didn't, I, I didn't give a rat's arse, as he got to say. I just, so you got a drum kit, big deal. So yeah, all right. He says, you can, we'll see, you'll see it later when we go to my house. I went, oh, okay then, yeah. Went to his house and uh, he said, oh yeah, come to my room, see my drum kit. And I looked at it and I might as well have been looking at um, a bottle of Coca-Cola. The way I looked, I just went, oh, okay. Right. Um, and he said, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. He said, do you want to have a go? And I went, I suppose. All right. He gave me the drumsticks and I went and sat behind it, clueless totally clueless, sat down and I went, okay, and I went, that was it, that was it. Okay. I don't know what happened, a little flick, a little, little switch got flicked, and I was totally in love with the idea of, of playing drums, from that second. Really? Yeah. Wow. And I came home that night, went out the next day, bought myself a set of drumsticks, and found boxes and stuff at home to set out so I could play drums. I put them on a bed, I'd sit there, you know, trying to drum to all these songs that I've been listening to that I was loving, you know, all these different genres. Right. Uh, and, you know, fast forward about a year, by then, of course, the cardboard boxes have gone because I was thrashing them to death. <laughs> they, they, didn't last, they didn't last two seconds. As a matter of fact, let me ask you, in, in the States, you must have had... Um, a hair dryer that looked like a, it was a little square, like it looked like um like your cable box, a little yeah. unit back there, and the pipe came out to a hat that you wore on your head. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Right? Yeah, all the mums had one, right? But my oh, mum yeah. my mum had one in the box. I'm gonna use the box as my drum. And that was my first drum was that box for that hair, for that hair dryer. But of course, after about a week and a half of thrashing it with these sticks. It started to tear and rip, and there were bits flying everywhere. I bet. In the end, I was playing like a mushy box. There was not much of it left, and I thought, <laughs> "That's not really going to do you know, much, is it?" So I decided, you know what? I'm just as just as well. I sit on the end of the bed, you know, the edge of the bed, and play on the bed. Okay. Which is what I did for the next year and a half, um, and of course, constantly playing on the bed meant I eventually wore. That part where I played was a different colour to the rest of it because I wore through it and it was really thin and you could see what was underneath, right? But it was very gradual, so I never realised. I just I remember walking in my bedroom one day and I looked at it and I'm, was that the light reflecting on there? And I thought, it's a different colour. Why is it a different? And then I thought, oh my god, that's what I've been playing. You know, my mum's gonna kill me. <laughs> By that kid, a set of drums. I'm well, no, I did. No, I bought his drums in the end. A, oh, year, a year and a half later, because it was just like a passing fad for him. He hadn't really, he played a bit, but I'd become a better drummer drumming on the bed than he had with a proper drum. <laughs> kit, I did it every night. I was totally immersed in it. I would sit there and drum until I was sweating and right, okay, that's it, tonight's one. The next night, every single night, that's all I did. Um, so in the end, I ended up buying his drum kit. Which in itself leads to another story. Okay. Right now, I don't know. Do you remember? Right. So basically, I was asked to join a band, a soul band called Headquarters. This is back. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is back in 1974. Oh wow! Okay. 
Okay. So, no, no, so, no. So it's about 19, no, no, wrong. Sorry, about 1977. 77, okay. Right? 77, 78. Um, I've only been drumming for a few years. I was going to say, you had to have been pretty young. Yeah, yeah, no, I was young. I was young. I was young. I was about 17. Okay. I was, I was 17 and I just left school. I, uh, I was just about to go to to college and I taught myself to play through constant, you know, just sitting there pushing myself. And uh, this band said, you know, they were auditioning and I went to audition. I took my drum kit, set up and played. And for me, and it's still one of the greatest accolades I have ever received, the fact that this really hip black band, really funky, and I'm, I'm into my soul, I'm into my James Brown, I'm into my... Right, James, right. And they turned around and said to me, oh, you know, we, we want you to play, you know, we play for us, blah, blah, blah. And then one of them said, quote of the century for me, he said to me, he said, the actual fact, I have to say, he said, for a white guy, you're pretty funky. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I have arrived, you know. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. But then, it's, then they said to me, look, there's only one problem. We want you to join the band. No doubt. We, we love your drumming. We want you to play. You know, you've got the funk. But you cannot come on stage with that drum kit because it was rubbish. It was, it was, I mean, I bought it off the guy for 25 quid. Okay. Not a great drum kit for 25, even in those days. Right, right. And they said, you, you can't come, can't come on stage. It's like, no, you know, we'll get laughed on stage. You'll get laughed on stage. And I thought, that's actually right. But I said, well, how am I going to get a drum kit? I'm, I've just left school. I'm about to go to college. My parents didn't support my musical um, desires at all. Okay. They thought it was like, get a real job. That's not a real job. <laughs> Playing music. Not like that. Uh, thought I was going to get a job at the time, but they thought, it's a hobby. But I, I knew, because of the way they were and the culture that we came from, I knew that they'd, they'd frown upon it and go, well, that's nonsense. You know, education is where the real thing is. Education and go out and get a job, you know. Right. Um, so... I just said, look, I can't join the band then. So I stayed friends with them anyway for a couple of few years. And eventually, I mean, they got a drummer that was actually better than me anyway. He was fantastic. And I became friends with him and he was a great, great drummer. Great okay. Drummer. Um, but then after a while, as with most bands that don't make it, or even with a lot that do, they eventually broke up and they split into two bands. And one became a band called Central Line who had hits in the UK and were on top of the pops. Uh, they had a couple of hits. And the you other band- DJ Groove Phoenix. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll do it again. <laughs> One more time. Lynx, who again had loads of hits. I don't know if you know them, but both soul bands. Um, Lynx had the hit with You're Lying and So This Is Romance. Okay. And a guy called David Grant was their singer. So I don't know if you know David Grant. Okay, okay. So. Both these bands are now on TV, and I'm watching them. You know, I used to watch Top of the Pop religiously, as most people did at the right, time. Right, right. And I think, I could have been in that band. Oh, I could have been in that, that band. If I joined, you know, the, the initial band, Headquarters, I would have been in one of the two. When it split, I would have been either in that one or that one. I would have right, been right. And I sat there thinking, I could have been in them and been on Top of the Pops. No, no, no. Oh, I could have been with those and been on Top of the Pops. No, no, no. <laughs> and then the weird thing is, only a short while later, probably a year and a half, I was on top of the pops with Modern Romance. Wow. Bizarre. That went fast. Yeah. Wow. It, yeah it really bizarre. Really bizarre. Um, so, yeah, I mean, don't forget, I mean, yeah, I met them when I was 17. Their hits probably happened when I was 21, giving it a couple of years of headquarters and then splitting up. Right, right. So, uh, but in, uh, at 23, I was on top of the pops with my romance, so it wasn't very long after that, really, in real terms. But that, yeah, that drunk, it was a bone of contention because they were saying, you can't come with that. And that cost me, obviously, a, a chance to be in that band and go on with one of these. But then, like I said, fate steps in, and there you go. I'm in modern romance. And that came about, again, because I happened to go to a club. There was a club in London called The Blitz, a very famous club. Yeah, maybe uh, Rusty Egan might have had something to yeah, do with that. Yeah. One, that's the one, yeah. Rusty Egan's Blitz. I went there one night with a friend. We said, What should we do tonight? Should we go there? Yeah, string fellow. Let's go to the Blitz. We went to the Blitz and a band. We walked in, and as I looked to my left, there was a band packing up their equipment. And I went, Oh, we missed the band. I wonder who these guys were. And I just happened to ask someone that was sitting there. I said, Sorry, mate. I said, 
was this band any good that we've missed? And he went, yeah, they weren't bad. He said, they said they were pretty funky. So when I heard the word funky, I thought soul, funky, I was like, so I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I went over to speak to the drummer and introduced myself and said, um, I'm looking for a spot in a band. I've just left the band I was in. So if you, I'll give you my number. If you know any bands that need a drummer that play music, your kind of music. I assumed it was soul when he said funky. So I said, yeah. if, you, if you know anybody that plays your kind of music, needs a drummer, please my number. And he went, okay, and he kicked it. <clears throat> then, <coughs> so about a week later, I get a phone call um, saying, would you like to come and play percussion for us? Now, I'm not a percussionist, but I can mess around. Right, right. Before I actually got to do the gig or got to meet them or do anything, I get a second call a few days later. And they said, were you the drummer in Blah Blah Band, this band that I used to play in before? It was a bit of a cult band in London. And, uh, and I said, yeah. And they went, oh, okay then. Um, would you like to be our drummer? And I went, well, hang on. What about the bloke who I spoke to, your drummer? What about him? <laughs> That's all well, to be honest, we've been looking to get rid of him for a while. So if you want to join, that's right. But if you don't join, we'll just find someone else. So it's either you or someone, but he's not going to be in the band very long because he's on the way out. We don't we don't really want him. Wow. So I thought about it and uh, but then I said, Well, you're asking me to join, but you haven't heard me. And they said, No, but we know all about the band you were in before, and everyone said what good musicianship there was within the band. So if that was you, that's good enough for us. So I thought. I'm not really treading on anyone's toes because if I don't if I don't take the job, someone else will. So I said, okay. Um, and I arranged to go and see them live. Because I said, look, I need to come and see you. I'm not just going to join the band without hearing you. Went and saw them play live. Liked what I heard. I, there was a certain raw energy that I liked. Right. Um, and then the, the, the inspiring thing was coming home to tell my parents, once I'd agreed to join them, they said, look, we rehearsed during the day because none of us work and we rehearse during the day. Um, so if you're going to join, you're going to have to rehearse during the day with us, which meant giving up your day job. Uh-huh. So, uh, and signing on the dole, you know, go, going on uh, welfare, whatever it's called. In right, right. Just, yeah. So I had to come home and tell my parents that I'm, I'm leaving my job <laughs> to join a band that no one's ever heard of to rehearse during the day. And my dad's words were, you will never amount to anything. And I took those words and I thought, okay. And eight weeks later, after joining them, because I didn't know as well, it, it, it's, it's all the matter of, it's just so weird the, things, the way things work out. I right. didn't know that, I didn't know they had a record deal. Okay. And I didn't know they'd already had released two singles and they both bombed big time. But that, that's it, on the scrap heap straight away. I had, had no clue. So when I joined them and we did the first rehearsal, that's when I found out about the record deal because I heard somebody discussing and they mentioned you know, the record company. I went, what record company? Oh, we've got a record deal. Just something we forgot to mention, you know. Wow. And I went, oh, okay. So I was like, oh, they've got a record deal. I was up there in inside thinking, wow, they've got a record deal. Then they said, yeah, we've already released two singles, but they both flopped. And the record company said, when we release the next one, if it's not, if it's not a hit, that's it, we're off the label. So from there, I went back down there again, thinking, oh, this is not good. Um, but the first single was Everybody's Salsa. So we were, it was a hit. Right, so within, right. Within eight weeks of joining them, I was on top of the pops. Wow. And, and, and the irony is my dad saying to me, you'll never amount to anything. And then a few weeks later, because our, our hit was in the summer of, of 81. He, okay. then goes, he then goes to Cyprus on a holiday and he's in a restaurant and, and people, people, relatives were telling me this. They said, he's in a restaurant with friends and having something to eat and everybody salsa came on the, on the radio and he jumped up in the restaurant. He's going, this is my son on the radio. And I thought, oh, now you're all of a sudden you're proud. Where was your support when I needed it, mate? But now, right, right. Now all of a sudden you're jumping up and down. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious! <laughs> that's awesome, though, that they were able to see, to see, you know, the beginning of your rise. That's that's totally great, um, you know, and to be able to see that, you know, Dad got to eat his words a little bit there. Oh yes, massive, massive, massive slices of humble pie. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, yeah no doubt. 
Well, that, that, you know, that's good too. And um, yeah, talk about timing all the way around on some of those different situations. Uh, and you're right. You know, it is, it's totally just by chance sometimes the way that things work out. It's what's on board like what, what's going on with modern romance these days? I, I know probably an American tour is not necessarily in the picture, but are you guys touring again? What, what's going on? Yeah, we, we're just planning a tour at the minute. Uh, and in actual fact, I was going to go to Scotland on Sunday. It's just been postponed. Okay. <coughs> the trip to Scotland was to meet up with my manager because that's where he is. We've now got a new manager. And um, but he's just in the middle of sorting out a tour for me, or for us. Um, and so I'll be, I'll be going, I'm going to reschedule the, 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 uh, the trip to Scotland. Obviously, we were talking on the phone, but he's going to give me dates and tell me what he's sorted out. Um, so we've got that going on. We've got individual gigs that we're doing. And we've got one next weekend. We've got one a couple of weeks after that. Okay. We, we do a lot of the 80s things that go on in England, 80s nights and 80s festivals and stuff. Right, right. We, we're like a, a part of the staple diet for these things you know if an 80s weekend without modern romance is like well no we've got to have modern romance we're having them so yeah we do all these things they're Perfect great fit. yeah yeah and everyone dresses i mean everyone dresses up they go they go mad here for the 80s things <laughs> So this is going to end up on our uh, October 31st show. So I've got a couple of uh, quick questions um, kind of along those lines. Um, first of all, any Halloween plans at all? Um, no, well, I think we're doing a gig at Halloween. Okay. We're doing a gig, yeah. Okay, um, okay. Um, yeah, we're doing a gig. My kids are coming with me. I mean, my kids are 28 and 24 now, but they're my best friends. In actual fact, my daughter, who's 24, sings with, in the band with me anyway. Oh, nice. My son comes up. My son's a drummer, but he doesn't. He does it as a hobby. He doesn't. He doesn't. Not interested in doing it for work. Okay. He enjoys. Okay. It. He wants to stay like that. So, but they, he comes with us to keep us company. The three of us go. We've got the three. The three amigos, and we just go and do stuff together. Very cool. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> We've still got a Spotify channel. So actually now that I've actually gotten the official interview in, now we get to add modern romance to that as well. So it's all about exposing um, uh, exposing it to new listeners. So, and with the, with the sound like, you know, what the band has had pretty much since the you know beginning. Uh, and, you know, we could talk for hours, I'm sure, because it's such a long kind of sordid um, history of the band and, you know, the way that it's like sprouted and branched and, you know, veered off and all that. Um, it's nice to see, though, that you guys are still going. Is there a website that um, viewers can check out? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Modern Romance. Um, it's a, it's, it was modern-romance.com. But if you go there, it takes you to the new one. It's, it's, it's now modern romance dot something else. Anyway, but it immediately takes you. So you go modern-romance.com. It will take you to the new one. Okay. Remember. Okay. Uh, it could be dot org, it could be dot net, I don't know. But if you type right. romance.com and it will take you to the new site. Cool, cool. So yeah, viewers, you're gonna want to do that when you get a chance. You gotta check um the band's uh, music out. Honestly, one of my absolute favorites of all time, and I still don't know why, unless it was a copyright situation, but one of my favorite tracks of all time over almost any other band is Band of Gold. Oh, do you know what? That's really weird. Somebody mentioned that. Was it yet yesterday they said, Oh yeah, I still love Band of Gold, you know. And I went, Oh, you know that one, do you? Um, oh my gosh. Now yeah. I, I realized that the, and that was a cover version, I believe Free to Pain might Free have Pain. been right, was the original artist. But that ended up on the Party Party soundtrack. Yeah. And actually the weird part was is that I looked for that song forever, and it's not even easy to find this uh, the album itself. Um, I don't know how many were ever printed, but to try and find Band of Gold, and I'm talking for like a couple of decades, I could not find it. I could find the Party Party soundtrack um, online, but that song was absent. Really? And I, and, and, yeah, it, uh, the Elvis Costello track, the Bananarama, um, Nick Lowe, Madness, all of those were all on there, but I could never find Band of Gold until about a year and a half ago, and, uh, and like magic, it popped up out of nowhere. 
Oh my gosh. I think I played that thing probably 10 times when I got it a hold of it the first day. Oh my gosh. Totally loved that one. I actually remember the day we recorded it. It's like really weird when you mentioned something. Oh yeah, I remember sitting there doing it thinking, yeah, yeah, do, do this, we do that, change that bit. And oh my gosh. Well, and the original was such a classic itself, but then the the spin that you guys put on it was just amazing. Um, hey, I see we're starting to really get close on time. So let's do this. Um, word to the world. If you could say anything to uh, our watchers and uh, listeners today, what would it be? Be kind and be nice because not enough people in the world are kind or nice. They all think about themselves. And I think it's about time we started thinking about people that are less, it sounds corny, but there are so many people less fortunate than us that we, you know, start, I mean, I, every day I get up and I say, thank God I do this job. I'm so privileged. I'm so lucky. And I'm so lucky to have this stuff around me and my kids and my, the house and food. And I think, well, there are so many people that don't have this. And I really, you know, Global warming and everything else aside, I really think you ought to think about people that are in immediate danger of not being able to eat and their kids not being able to eat and just, just knock on people's doors and say, look, I know you guys are not working. Are you okay? Do you need anything? I think if everyone did that a little bit more, it just be so nice. I know. I know. Well, we kind of go through little phases like that, though, you know, like when, when like we'll get hit with the pandemic, yeah. you know, here in the States, right after 9-11 hit. You know, it's like it takes sometimes a real bad situation to happen for us to like go, oh, yeah, we're all human. Maybe we should like look out for each other and, you know, check to make sure that the next person's OK. Um, awesome. Hey, I want to let you know, too, um, door is always open for future reference. Anytime that you want to come back, uh, you got any new news to share or whatever, uh, the door here is always open for you. So please keep that in mind. All right. Thank you. Well, we've got new stuff being released soon. Um I'm just going to finish off a track later on this week. Um, cool. Because I can't go, to, there's a track that's time sensitive. So because I can't now go to Scotland because it's all been changed. Right. I'm, I'm going to record it over the weekend at home and send it. And they're going to put it onto the music that's over there. So I'm going to do the vocal track here. Okay. And they're going to put it on there and finish it. Nice. That. Um, we've done that before, but I, I prefer to do it in the studio because you get the people around you and you have a laugh and you just the whole fun thing. Right, right. Oh, no but, doubt. Well, but, well, cool. So there is, there's definitely stuff to be watching forward. Um, we've got less than a minute. So I'm just going to say right now, in case this thing pops off on us, Andy, thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure, honestly. Anytime. It's been, it's been, it's been a real pleasure for me too. And I'm finally glad that we got this one done and out of the way. <laughs>